For as long as she could remember, music was always a huge part of her life. And from adoring fans to bright lights, cameras to red carpets, it never seemed enough. There was always something that wasn't quite right. Allah. Allah was what was missing. This is my next record. Sheikh Yahya Ibrahim brought us around Langford Islamic College in Perth, where he is the assistant principal in religious education. The college welcomes all students from different walks of life, from kindergarten all the way to year 12. Since it opened in 2004, Langford Islamic College now has around 1,000 students, and it combines strong and relevant Islamic elements with a structured secular curriculum. Their aim is to provide an integrated and holistic education in line with Islamic values. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, yeah, thank you for visiting uh, the Langford Islamic College in, in Perth, Australia. Uh, this is our musalla, uh, so it's not a masjid, and that's why, uh, you know, as you can see, it's a little bit more open space. Uh, it holds about 800 people up top, and we'll have uh, two or three different prayers throughout the day. Uh, the nice part of this is it's part of the multi-purpose uh, gym. So we'll pray Jumu'ah here just for the students. Most of the salah and the things that we do are training. So even after salah, you'll notice I'll do the dhikr out loud, even the tasbih, because it is a school. So the primary purpose is not to function as a masjid. Right. Uh, but uh, across the other side, you'll see uh, some of our senior boys are playing their, their soccer. And uh, we have our uh, competitions and Quran competition and assemblies and, and so on uh, here every morning. And it's just a place for us to uh, be able to meet and a, a safe place for our young people to enjoy themselves and enjoy their time with, uh, with each other. I actually like to ask you, if you don't mind, if you would like to share a little bit about your life as a student. But when you were 16, was that when you knew, okay, I want to be a scholar? Absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I knew I wanted to know what the Quran meant. Okay. And I was blessed with uh, gifted teachers. Mm -hmm. And you will yeah. only be a gifted student if you have gifted teachers. And those teachers, many of them who have passed away, may Allah have mercy on them and put me in their scale. And mm -hmm. those who are still alive remain my mentors. They remain people that I ring up and ask questions uh, to, as, as you would ring up someone you value their opinion and mm -hmm. ask them questions. Mm -hmm. um, and the pursuit of knowledge is lifelong. It never ends. Okay. So at the moment, I'm uh, interested in the madhab of Imam Malik, and mm -hmm. it's one of my keen fields of study. And I do uh, online things for it, and you know, and, and sit with teachers who can teach it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whether I'm Shafi'i by uh, trade or not, okay. you know. But it, you know, you want to learn more, <laughs> and, and, and it's yeah. it's unending. Okay. So I didn't know that I would do what I'm doing. Uh, personally, I look at myself as an educator mm. who happens to have Islam as part of that educating process in their life. Alhamdulillah. So I just want to know, um, you know, we're talking about your youth, but were you like a rebellious youth? Like I know I was. Oh I, dear. I, I, <laughs> if you don't mind me asking. Uh, it's a good thing my dad is in here. He, he, <laughs> he'd have lots and lots of stories. Okay. Uh, I'd like to think I wasn't rude to my parents. Okay. Alhamdulillah. But yeah. I gave him a challenge. And I think all of us, we give it. I'm sure you did, I yeah. did, all of us. Anyone who's watching uh, gives that challenge. It's not something because we don't want to, you know, we want to experience things and we want to make mistakes in our own way. And mm -hmm. sometimes my dad would say, hey, don't do that because, and I'd be like, no, 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 no I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And then it will happen. I'd be like, let's see, I told you because, you know, when I was your age, and I said, well, I don't want to know about when you were my age. <laughs> when you were my age, it wasn't the same as my age. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we have typewriters and you, you, probably, you guys had pens. Now it's like we got mobile phones or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so that kind of, uh, yeah, it wasn't intentional disobedience, mm -hmm. but it was mucking up and getting into trouble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a lot of it is now regretful. May Allah forgive me for 
days and weeks and uh, maybe even years of, of when I should have been praying that I didn't pray consciously. Mm -hmm. Or if I did it, I did it because my dad, you know, would ask, hey, did you pray your asu when you came home from school? Right, right. You know, those kind of things are, are uh, of greater worry to me than what my dad's forgiven me for, my mom's forgiving me for. Mm -hmm. So I was a challenging child because I always wanted to know things and I wanted to experience things and I wanted to travel and I would travel alone and okay. you know I wanted to I, I wanted to, to, to see to see the world, see the world. and mm -hmm. um, and my parents were understanding in that. They knew that I was pushing boundaries uh, of our culture and so on, but it wasn't something that was malicious and I think that's the key. Uh, you never want to be someone who's rotten inside. You want to have a good soul. You might do the wrong things, but you know they're wrong. You don't accept the wrong as being right. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the saving graces. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all for our Ameen, our Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. SubhanAllah, I can, very, I can very much relate to that. So Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah Khair Shaykh for sharing a little bit about your, your personal life. Alhamdulillah. Ameen. So I was 13 years old, I think. I was in like form two or form three, yeah? And a friend of mine was gonna have a party, right? And, I, and then I asked my parents, can I go? And they're like, no, you can't go. And I threw such a big fit. I was like, I was so upset that my parents didn't let me go to the party and sleep over, yeah? I sound like a, like a spoiled brat, right? So I went into inside my room, I started playing heavy metal music and I started headbanging and I was like, ah, oh! right? And it was so, because it was like 10 or 11 at night and my, my room is, was right next to my parents' room and I was, get, I was being such a brat, right? And then my parents, my dad came and then he said, okay, if you want to go, you can go, but you have to be back. And I was like, okay, and then I switched off everything and I went to sleep. So, you know, it was just one of those things like, that kids do, you know what I mean? When they, when they, they, wanna, they want everything now, everything has to be yes. You know, uh, everything has to happen immediately and you know, you, you know, you think you're going to live forever, you just want to party, you just want to have fun and that's the only thing that's important in life. So, yeah. I definitely had an Iman high when I uh, first came back from Hajj. I was so uh, motivated and determined to learn as much as I can. And, um, you know, I, I made lots of dua, like, Ya Allah, grant me beneficial knowledge. And um, I was introduced to go to a couple of, you know, Islamic courses. And it was like, I, I made sure that I went for an Islamic course like every single time. It was like, every month, at least one, like, full on, you know, like, week class. But definitely my Quran classes continued. But this whole Iman high was like, you know, I wanted to learn and absorb everything as much as I can and, and as fast as possible. I wanted to memorize and learn and do as much as I could. And um, it went on for a while, alhamdulillah. It went on for a while. Um, but I felt like after I was done with my um, diploma course with Aries University, I felt like I needed some time to really kind of, you know, fall back into just the basics again and kind of try to implement what I'm learning. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, one of the things that I, I think is also important to acknowledge and, and to speak about is um, where we go out of balance, where you know, sometimes we've had an excess in our life. Some things that, you know, we know weren't right. And Alhamdulillah, Allah guides us. You know, it could be a friend who pulls us back from the brink or, you know, there's something that leads us back towards Allah. Alhamdulillah. Sometimes it's a crisis that brings us back to Allah or something bad happens and we wake up or sometimes something good happens and we want to acknowledge Allah. But one of the problems that happens with that, which is associated with that, is we, we kind of lose ourselves and become like the haram police where all of a sudden we don't let other people understand that they also have a chance to come back to Allah in their own way and in their own time. And because I'm walking or running with faith now, it doesn't mean I need to look at a, a person who's a baby in faith and expect them to run along with me. And there are stages to growing our faith and we always forget where we were 
a year ago, a week ago, a month or two uh, before when we're critical of others. Anytime you see someone and you feel compelled to correct them in front of others, you've done wrong. Because the correction in front of others shouldn't be your first mode of thought. That's actually for yourself, it's not for their benefit. I, I get three rules to live by. Before you say something, ask yourself, is it related to me? Like, does it really have something to do with my life and my sphere of influence? Am I responsible for it? And that comes from the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, if someone sees something that is munkar, wrong, and they have the power to change it, change it. It's my job, it's my place, I can change it, okay. But if you don't, ask yourself, if I can't change it, can I at least say something to someone that perhaps can change it? And if no, then I don't like it in my heart, but it doesn't mean I do anything about it. And not doing anything is a sunnah. There were times where the Prophet ﷺ would sit back and see someone doing something completely wrong and he wouldn't say a single thing, not to them. And that's the level of hikmah. You know, that's why wisdom is defined as putting everything in its right place, speaking about everything in its right time, speaking to the right person for the right reason in the right way is very, very important. It's not what we say, but how we say it. The body language we have, the tone of voice, the inflection in our voice, the look in our eyes. You know, those are the things that you know, your parents could give you a look from across the room, it was more than saying anything, right? Because there's hikmah there. And other times, they, maybe they have to raise their voice, right? There's wisdom uh, in that. May Allah bless us with hikmah, and may Allah make us guides to others, guides to their hearts, and not critical of others, uh, uh, pushing people away. And I leave you with this hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he would say, يَسِّرُ وَلَا تُعَسِّرُ Make things easy for people, don't make things difficult. وَبَشِّرُ وَلَا تُنَفِّرُ And invite people to the good, don't drive them away because you've scared them from it. May Allah make us of those. Allahumma Amin. I think with the knowledge, Alhamdulillah, that Allah has blessed with me so far, um, is knowledge for me is a blessing. And um, I feel that I have still so much more to learn because whatever I have learned these past few years, I feel that perhaps only a certain percentage I have fully understood and I am practicing, you know. So there's still a lot more to do with the knowledge that I've, I, I have listened to and I've learned so far. And I feel that, yeah, you know, when I first made my hijra, I was on this huge iman high. I think that most of us have that. And I always want, I wanted to learn everything. Um, but then it came to a point where I felt like, you know what, I need to hold on a little bit and go back to basics and actually try to practice the things that I have learned already and make it something that I, I do every day, you know. And that in itself is a big challenge. And then I come to a point where I feel like I'm a little bit stagnant, you know. I feel like as if I'm not growing spiritually or I'm not learning, I'm not doing enough. And so, and so then I feel the need to continue to seek knowledge that is beneficial. And so for me, I, I need to reflect upon myself a lot to know where I'm at, to know whether I need to pull back and then really, really, you know, practice or I need to actually go forward and learn more. And so it's kind of like a tug of, tug of war thing, but whatever it is, I know that seeking knowledge is something that is very important um, throughout my entire life and inshallah until the day that I die. When it comes to advising people like our parents, our spouses and children, what's the best way to go about it? Uh, look, speaking truth to power is uh, jihad, it is a, a, a way of uh, establishing justice and establishing what is right. It's a struggle for God. And the Prophet says the greatest struggle that a person can do is to stand in front of someone who's a tyrant, who's uh, you know, uh, all powerful and abusive in their, in their tyranny and to still speak the truth. Uh, I leave you with a beautiful story. One of the great Imams his name is Al-Imam Ibn al-Jawzi. He lived in Baghdad in the height of its peak of, of Islamic teaching and learning. And he's one of the greatest orators, writers, muhaddith, everything. He was a master of all disciplines. And he used to have thousands of students who would attend his classes. But um, one class he would reserve for his closest student, you know, the top of the cream, the cream of the, the, the bunch. And they would sit near the Euphrates River as we're sitting here near the Swan River in Perth. And as he would be talking to them, 
They saw on the other bank of the river a group of young people partying, men and women, and it was just haram stuff, you know, drinking and, you know, things that weren't unethical, un uh, immoral, uh, according to them. So they said, Ya Imam, Ud'Allah, oh Imam, make dua against these people. Who are these people? Corrupt, they've taken time from our hadith class with you. So he raised his hands, he said, Allahumma kama afrahtahum fid dunya, fa'azidhum farahan fil akhirah. He said, Oh Allah, as you brought these people joy in the dunya, give them joy in the akhirah. It's a weird way of saying, Oh Allah, guide them. Like he's saying, Oh Allah, make them happy in the akhirah means, Oh Allah, give them guidance that will show them what they're doing is wrong. Because if they stay this way, they won't be happy in the akhirah. Oh Allah, make them happy in the akhirah as you've made them. They're happy now. Make them happier in the akhirah, Ya Rab. It's a wonderful way of looking at how to deal with other people's indiscretions. May Allah open our hearts towards others and allow us to forgive others for their trespasses as Allah forgives us for ours. And may Allah make us examples and guides to others. Allahumma amin. When I share information, there were times that I did do some mistakes. For example, somebody would send me like a WhatsApp and they would say, okay, um, if you do this on this particular day and on that particular day, it's going to be really good for you. Um, and so I fell into that whole, not trap, lah, but you know, it's just one, one of those automatic things where you just throw it uh, without checking whether it's actually uh, legit information. And so, yeah, I did that a couple of times, um, but I, alhamdulillah, you know, Allah has granted me good teachers. They, they told me, look, you know, make sure if you have information just to double check if it's correct or not. If it's not correct, then you just delete. And so I've done that a couple of times. Yeah, um, you know when we receive, we receive information, knowledge, um, either through WhatsApp or Facebook or even Instagram, um, how do we know of its authenticity and how do we actually check the authenticity? Mm, it's, it's such a topical issue and it goes back to how social media really influences so many things in our life mm -hmm. because it's so instantaneous and that one, you know, that one button you push send, yeah. it actually can touch like thousands of people. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, what, one of the beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, it's an authentic hadith, he says, يَحْمِلُ هَذَا الدِّينَ مِنْ كُلِّ خَلَفٍ عُدُولُ This deen, this faith, this ilm, this knowledge of this faith will be carried from one generation to the next generation to the next generation by the upright and noble mm -hmm. amongst your ulama, amongst the scholars. And that these scholars will do three things. Uh, they will cleanse it for impurities that have entered into it. Okay. So therefore the Prophet ﷺ is okay. telling us that there will be things that will masquerade mm -hmm. as religion. Okay. There will be people who will lie about the Prophet ﷺ, about his okay. companions. And the second is تحريف الغالين that they will also repeal the uh, uh, incorrect understanding. It's not just that there will be things that are entered into faith that are incorrect, lies about him, mm -hmm. but there will be people who will inter interpret it incorrectly. Okay. And that these scholars will say, hold on, hold on, that's not how you understand this verse. And therefore, when you see a lot of the things that are happening in the world, whether extremism, and the Prophet uses the word ghalin, which is ghulu, which means extremism. Mm -hmm. And the root of extremism comes from misinterpretations. Uh, Allah says something about one person, but you're applying it to everyone. Mm -hmm. And that would happen at the time of the Prophet Wasallam. So he would say, you have to be very careful with this. Okay. And uh, the third thing is that the dilution of faith. So all of a sudden, it's something that everyone knows is from faith and people now come and say, oh, but you know, maybe this was, uh, maybe we can compromise on it. Mm -hmm. And the ulama stand firm and say, no, 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 we don't compromise on those kind of things. Okay. So. Those three kind of things, when they come together, um, uh, whatever is being transmitted from those people will be verified. Okay. You want to be able to, whatever you forward to others, something that you can stand before Allah and say, Oh Allah, this was correct. This okay. represents your word. This represents 
the lifestyle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have too many people today who, you know, open uh, the Quran or the Hadith and seek to interpret it in their own terms. Their own terms right. And sometimes it's not even from the original source, it's from a translation. Right. Uh, you know, uh, there was one time I opened the translation of Riyadh al-Salihin, which mm -hmm. is a foundational Hadith book in, in our studies mm -hmm. uh, by Imam al-Nawawi, rahmatullahi alayhi. And I was reading in English right before Salah began. And I looked at the translation and I said, the Prophet used to love to eat curry. Oh, really? And I thought, curry? Did he have curry? No. Really? At, okay. the, at that time, and I said, well, mm -hmm. let me look at the Arabic of this hadith. And it said, Can Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mm -hmm. The Prophet used to like the stew that meat was cooked in. Okay. So if you were a translator from India or Pakistan, yeah. what do you cook meat in? Curry. So when right. he translated it, he put in his own interpretation. interpretation. And, you know, that's, that's a problem. Mm. Uh, if you open the translations of the Quran, you will see so many different things that are quite shocking in that sense. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to us um, going back to the original sources and understanding the original sources the way the Imams have understood it from the very beginning. So that's what you want to aim for. So it, it shouldn't just be a reflex thing. If it doesn't sound right, yeah. read it again, okay. verify it with someone who you can verify it with okay. and don't just risk it. Okay, subhanAllah, mm. some very good advice. Inshallah. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean. So what is important to me now is going back to the basics, re-looking at the things that I've learned about the heart, about the Quran, about the Sunnah, and really trying to implement those, those daily things in my life. Simple things like du'as that I should memorize every single day. Simple things like perhaps trying to pray um, closer to the time or on time. Things like uh, making sure that I pronounce my mahraj, you know, when I'm reading the Quran properly, you know, um, and understanding a bit of Arabic as well. You know, these, these things are so important to me right now. And um, inshallah, once I am at a level where I feel like I can um, learn more in terms of fiqh and other things and hadith, inshallah I will get there. But for now, it's back to the basics. I found myself at a crossroads. To my left was a road I passed by a million times. To my right was a road, unclear and signed. And then I looked inside and saw a bright light and found the missing hook I was searching for all my life. That was when I knew what my next record was. It was gonna be the one that counts. It is the only one that's gonna count. The one where I pray so hard, it'll reach me to the top to be amongst the cream of the crop. It'll hold my good deeds, I pray I won't stop. The only record to be playing when my microphone eventually drops. This record is with my maker my one and only creator, the ultimate writer, author of my life, my savior.